study the purpose of each step or of each message. Receive it in our lives. Study the second step. Receive it in our lives. Go to the third, study it, and then welcome it in our, in our lives. Now the next quotation, it is it's going to tell us more about the third step. So it says the theme of greatest importance is the third angel's what? So all these steps are important. All these steps are what? All these steps are what? I say if I call and you don't respond, you demoralize me. So I want to hear you responding all together. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm a teacher and I always teach young people. So sometimes I may want you to respond like young people. So I want you to respond so that we move. All together. So all messages are important. But he goes ahead and now talks about the third step. He says the theme of greatest what? Importance is the third angel's what? Message. Embracing the message of the first and the second and the second. So however much the third step is very important, again, it cannot stand on its what? On its own. It embraces the first and the what? And the second. So this third step is very important. But however much it is very important, it will stand and it will do its work after we have received the first and the second work and the second step and the second step. So I want you to have that in the mind that we have what we call the third angel's message. When we go to the book of Revelation 14, it talks about the man, the image, the beast, its image and its what? And its mark. That's what it only talks about. But as we are going to say, the third angel's message is a very broad subject. When we come to Revelation 14, we are just having a vision. Remember we said God reveals truth using how many means? Three means. He uses parables, he uses visions, and he uses figures. So when we come to Revelation 14, that is the gospel in it. That's the gospel in what? That's the gospel revealed in what? In figures? That's the gospel revealed in visions. So what we have in Revelation 14 is very small of what is inside the third angel's what? Third angel's message. So we shall need to gather information from the parable about the third angel. We shall need to gather information from the figures about the third angel, third angel and then bring it together with what we see in Revelation 4, 14. So this theme is very, very important. All of us need to under, understand it. However, it cannot stand on its what? On its own. It is very important and it's going to be a blessing to each one of us after we've understood the first and the second what? Second step, which is the first and the second angel's what? Second angel's me message. He goes ahead and says, all should understand the truth contained in these messages. Brothers, if we are to be saved, we all need to understand, understand those three steps or the three messages. I'm going to be emphasizing this statement again and again. The gospel runs in three steps. In most cases, when we are proclaiming the gospel, we are proclaiming it as if the gospel runs in only one word in one step. So I want us that by the end of our presentations, when our minds are un they are they are they are un unlocked, when we can all see these city steps clearly, knowing what is our responsibility in the first step, what is our responsibility in the second, and what is our responsibility in the third, in the third, and what God does for us in the first step, second and what? In the third. So he says, all should understand the truth contained in these messages. He says, for they are essential to salve, salvation. 
So these steps are very important for our salvation. Salvation, but we need to ask ourselves the question: salvation from what? These messages they are important for our salvation, but the question comes in: salvation from what? From what is the purpose of this study? So it goes ahead and says, we shall have to understand to study honestly. In most cases, we don't want to study honestly. But we are going to study uh, honestly. Somewhere we shall need to reason from cause to what? Effect. From cause to effect. Amen. If you are to fully comprehend these me messages. messages. So we shall have to study honestly in order to understand this truth. And our power to learn and to comprehend will be taxed to the utmost. Our power to do what? To learn and to comprehend will be taxed to the utmost. I want to let you know we are going to come to a point where we must combine the figure, the parable, and the vision together to come up with one story. It's going to require us to use our sanctified brains to put these things together and we see a connected what? A connected story. So be ready to study honestly. Be ready to have a fixed mind. Today the problem we have, our minds are fixed. There is a way we've been educated. Our minds cannot think outside the box. The box. But God is calling us to have a mind that can reason outside the box, the box that can reason from cause to effect to effect. Signs of the Times, Times, July 4th, 1906, paragraph 4, it is still emphasizing the third angel. He says the book of Revelation must be opened to the people. Many have been told that it is a sealed what? A sealed book. But it is sealed to those who it is sealed to those only who reject the truth and what? And light. The truth that it contains must be proclaimed that the people may have an opportunity to prepare for the events which are soon to take place. I want to adjust this quotation a little bit. You want to adjust the what? It begins by saying the book of Revelation must be opened to the people. I'm going to say the book of Daniel and Revelation must be opened to the what? To the people of God. Why should they be opened to the people of God? That the people may have an opportun opportunity to prepare for the events which are soon to take what? To take place. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 should be understood. The people of God should understand the verses then 11, 40 to 45 in the, in the, in the direction beg your pardon. The book or the verses then 11, 40 to 45 should be understood by the people of God in line with Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. We must get those events and then connect them with the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, such that the people of God should know what to do and prepare themselves for what is coming ahead of us. So in most cases we've proclaimed and we are telling people, Sandalo is coming, Sandalo is coming. But we've not labored let them know what is supposed to be their responsibility when it comes to the Sunday law. What is supposed to be their responsibility before Sunday law. So as we're proclaiming these events, connect them with the work that's going up in the heavenly sanctuary and let each one of us understand our responsibility. 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 What we are supposed to do as these events are, go are going on so that at the end of the day we will not be caught outside. So he goes ahead and says, the third angel's message must be presented as the only hope for the salvation of the perishing what? Well, whenever I read this quotation, I feel like we've not done anything. 
because our minds are still so narrow about what is the third angel's message. But we say, if we need to understand the third angel's message, we need to get all the figures, the parables, and the visions that I talk about the third. Okay. The third. So he's still emphasizing the third step. The sister who is sleeping, wake up. So he's still emphasizing the third step. You've not seen her. Don't look behind. So he's still emphasizing the third what? The third step. So the third step is so impo important. Which is this third step? What you can only reflect is what is brought to view to the visions when we come to the book of Revelation chapter 4, 14. But we are saying the third angel is a very good subject. subject. So have that in mind that we have a third step which is so impo important. However, the third step will be so important to us after we have welcomed the first and the second step. Second step. The third angel is uh, everything to us. But it's going to be everything to us after we've welcomed the first and the second angel's messages in our what? In our lives. So what is the purpose of the gospel? What is the purpose of these three steps? We will say their purpose is to save us. Isn't it? According to the quotations we've read. But we need to ask ourselves a question. To save us from what? To save us from what? So when we go to Romans 1, 16, up 17, this is what the Bible has to say. He says, for I am not ashamed of the what? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is power, for it is the, pa the power of God unto what? Unto salvation to everyone that does what? Never forget that last statement. To everyone that believeth. Pardon? Okay. To everyone. So it is power of God unto salve. salvation to everyone that believeth. So if you stop here, you may not still say. It's power of God unto salvation. Salvation from what? So you have to continue and read the next what? The next verses. It says, unto the Jews first, and also unto the, to the Greeks. Then 17, it says, for they are, for they are in, for in the go gospel, for in the gospel, which is the power of, who? of God, it says, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith, what? To faith. So in this case, what is revealed in them? What is manifested in these three steps? The righteousness of what? The righteousness of God. So what does that mean? The purpose or the burden of these three steps? Steps is to save us from unwhat? To save us from unrighteousness. So if in those three steps, the righteousness of Christ is money, manifestedly, automatically, the everlasting gospel has a purpose of saving us from un unrighteousness. It still emphasizes the issue of believing. It goes ahead and says, for therein is the righteousness of the gospel revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we are going to receive this righteousness if our faith, if faith is manifested in the first step, in the second step, and also in the third word, in the third step. We shall emphasize this point as we shall be going on. So what is this unrighteousness that the gospel must save us through those three steps? Mark my statements. What is this unrighteousness that the gospel is going to save us through how many steps? Question. Through the three steps. So the gospel is going to save us, but through how many steps? Question. 
through the three steps. So what is this unrighteousness? So if we go to Matthew 121, it says, And it shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Je Jesus, for he shall save his people from their what? From their sins. So first John's, the gospel saves us from unrighteousness. But when we come to Matthew 121, the gospel saves us from what? The gospel saves us from sin. So the gospel saves us from unrighteousness. The gospel saves us from sin. From sin. So sin is unrighteousness. All together. So we may need to go ahead and define what is sin. That the gospel is going to save us through those three steps. Through those three steps. So when we go to First Jones, three four, it's going to define for us what is sin. What is it? Sin that we must be saved from. It says, whosoever committed sin, whoever committed what? Sin transgresses also the what? Also the law. For sin is the transgression of the what? Of the law. So sin is transgressing what is what? God is law. If I can bring it in a simple language, Sin is breaking God is what? God is law, God is commandments. So the gospel is in place to save us from transgression of God is what? God is commandments. The gospel is in place to save us from breaking God is what? God is commandments. But through how many steps? This is through the three steps. And we must show how we are saved from this condition of breaking God is commandments. In those three steps. So Romans 3.10. Is telling us. That we are all unrighteous. The Bible is telling us. We are all un what? So it says. As it is written. 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous. So in simple terms, I can say, there is none that keepeth the what? The law. The law of God. All of us are transgressors. Sure. God is law. He says, there is none righteous, no, not one. He says, there is none that understandeth there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So all of us, we are transgressors. We are breakers of God's law, implying that all of us need the word. All of us need the gospel. All of us need to go through the steps. We need to receive the first, the second, and the third angels' messages in our, in our lives if we are to be saved from this condition of breaking God's commandment. We must receive the first angel. Do its work in us. After we've received the first, we must receive the second. And after we've received the second, we are going to receive the most, most, most important step, which is the third step. So if we go to Romans 3.6. 3.26. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3.26. The Bible is telling us that you... We did not only sin, but there are some consequences that it came with what? With sin. So it says, for all have what? So all have sinned. All have broken God's law. All have transgressed. But I like the next statement. It says, and come short of the glory of God. 
So what happened after we said it? We all came short of the glory of what? We all came short of the glory of God. In simple terms, I want to say after we all, after all had sinned, we all lost the image of who? We all lost the image of God in which we are created. So implying when the gospel comes in, it must save us from also that condition. We fell short of that glory. We fell short of that image. So it's going to be the purpose of the gospel to take us back to that image that, that we did what? We lost. That we lost after lawlessness. Pardon? It is verse 23. Yes. Oh, sorry. So it is Roman 3, 23. 23. So for all have sin and come short of the glory of God. So we did not sin and things ended there. There are consequences that came with the sin. The training or there are consequences that come with breaking God is what? God is comma commandments. And it's going to be the purpose of the gospel to save us from all this stuff. To save us from sin itself and then the consequences that came with what? Came with the sin. With sin. So what are some of these consequences that came with man breaking God's commandment? So when you go to Romans 5.12, it says, where, where, where for, as by one man, sin entered into where? Into the world. What happened? And death by what? By sin. And so death passed upon all men. For that all have what? For all have sinned. So when we became transgressors, what came with transgression? Death. And in most cases, when we talk about the death, we think of this death of losing your breath and you're buried into the, gro into the ground. But I believe the death that is brought to view in Romans 5 is the internal death of never to come back into what? Into existence. So when we transgressed in the Garden of Eden, you may ask you, now where are you there in the Garden of Eden? The Bible is telling us, by one what? Man. By one man we all see. While God was making one man, was making the whole what? The whole world. All of us were in Adam. And because all of us were in Adam, when he transgressed, we all transgressed. Transgressed. When death came, we are all subjected to what? To death because we are in earth with Adam. So we need to ask ourselves a question, why death? So when you go to Romans 6, 23, it tells us, for the wages of what? For the wages of sin is what? Is death. But the gift of God is internal what? Internal life through Jesus Christ our what? Our Lord. So why death? It's because the wages of what? Sins. The wages of breaking God's commandment is what? Death. Is death. So in our studies, we are going to see how God saves us from this condemnation. Because all of us, we are condemned to what? To death. I want to hear your voices. To death. We are all condemned to what? To death after transgressing God is what? God is commanding it. So we shall need to come and see how God deals with this. How does God say that through the three steps? steps from this condemnation? How are we set free from this condemnation? 
Is it done in the first step? Is it done in the second step? Is it done in the third what? In the third step. So we need to say how it is done, how God saves us from, how God sets us free from this conde, condemnation to those three steps, to those three step, steps. So the gospel must save us from sin. It must save us from sin. And sin is what? Transgression of God is what? God is commanding. And we are unlucky that we all transgress God is what? God is law. But good news is that there is a plan of what? Salvation. Plan of salvation, which runs in how many steps? Four in three steps where we are going to be delivered from that disease. Two, the gospel must save us from the wages of what? From the wages of what? Sin. How is it going to save us? Through those three what? Through steps. And we shall need to identify, identify how we are saved from this condemnation through those three steps. Jeremiah 17, 1 is telling us more what happened after sinning. So when we sin, Jeremiah 17, 1, it says, The sin of Judah is written with a pen of what? Pen of iron. Do we know a pen of iron? What's that pen that you have in your hands? It is a pen of plastic. So I don't know. But when we come to Jeremiah 17, he's telling us the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of diamond. So this is a sharp pen. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of the diamond. It is engraved upon the tables of what? Of their heart and upon the horns of your what? Of your altars. So when man transgressed, when man transgresses God's commandment, what happens? Sin is written upon the table of his what? Of his heart, but with which kind of pen? <clears throat> with a pen of iron. How does the pen of iron write? What happens if I want to write here? I use a metal. Why a metal? Because it is not easy to rub. It's going to scratch. And it's going to label this table perma permanently. So once we sin, sin was written upon the tables of our hearts with a pen of what? With a pen of iron. But where was it written? It was written on the heart. What is so special with the heart? Proverbs 4.23 So sin is written upon the heart. But we must examine what is the heart. So Proverbs 4.23, it says, Keep thy heart with all what? Diligence. Why do you need to keep your heart with all what? Diligence, he says, for out of it are the issues of what? Are the issues of life. So the heart is the spring of what? The heart is the spring of what? Life. The spring okay. of life. So where was sin written? The heart. On the heart. But what is the heart? Mind. Now according to this verse, what is the heart? Spring of life. The spring of what? Life. Of life. So sin was written on the spring of what? In the spring of life. So life springs from the heart. And that is where sin was what? 
was written. So what's going to happen to the entire man? Life is gone. Life is gone. First of all, the heart is contaminated with what? Sin. The heart is contaminated with sin. But since the heart is the source of what? That's where life comes from and it proceeds to the rest of the what? Of the sick? The system. What's going to happen to the entire system of man? Start dying. It's going to be deeper. Defiled. So man has a problem that after sinning, sin was written upon the source of life. The spring of life. So the spring of life was affected. And since this heart is the spring of life, it supplies life, if I can bring it in a, a literal sense, it supplies blood to the whole what? To the whole body. If the heart is sick, what's going to happen to the rest of the body? The body is also going to become what? Become sick. So the entire man was defiled with what? The entire man was defiled with what? With pain. And if we go through the Bible and look at this heart, the way it was defiled, it is beyond repair. So we are going to speak in this class, in this three, in these three steps, it's not a process of repairing the heart. But what happens? Man needs a new heart. heart. Needs a new heart because the heart was defiled by sin beyond repair. So in our sinful condition, we have a wicked heart which is beyond what? Which is beyond repair. And the only solution that God has for us is to give us a new heart. A new heart. So because sin is on the very source of life, that's why the Bible is telling us in Jeremiah, 17.9 The heart is the city full above all what? Above all things. And desperately wicked who cannot eat. So the main problem is with what? It is with the heart. It is with the mind. This is called the upper what? We have the lower what? Nature. There the are terms we use the, the lower and the, uh, and the higher. So sin is written on the higher power. And it completely destroyed the higher what? The higher power which is supposed to control the lower what? The lower power. So because the higher powers are destroyed and the entire human nature is defa defiled man became too weak in that he cannot stand in his own power again before the presence of God for the presence of God so the bible is saying the heart is deceitful but what makes it deceitful it's the sin written upon it it is this deceitful above all things. And because of this deceitfulness, when we go to Mark 7, 21 to 22, this is what it does. So it says, for from within, out of the what? Of the heart of men, proceedeth evil what? Evil thoughts, adulteries, Fornication, murderers, theft, covetousness, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, like what? Licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. He says all these things come from where? From where? For from within, from, from within, from within where? Within the heart, the heart and defile the man. So in our sinful state, in our sinful 
condition that is what proceeds out of our hearts. An unless man is blessed with a new heart, we cannot run out of that sinful condition. So that is why you don't need a second to sin. You don't need a second to what? Sin. To sin. A man does not need a second. Even he does not need a microsecond to look at a woman and sin. A wicked what? A wicked heart. That is what it is, and that is what comes out of what? Comes out of it. So when you come to the gospel, when you come to these three step, steps, man must be provided with a new heart. With a new heart. The gospel labors, as we are going to see, to provide the man with a new heart. With a new heart. And we need to understand where do we receive this new heart. Do we receive it in the first step? Second step or in the third step. We shall need to understand when do we receive this new heart and what is our responsibility in the, this process to receive a new heart, a new heart. So because of this wicked heart, we became slaves to what? We became slaves to sin. So when you come to Romans 7, 14, Paul is telling us a state of someone who's not yet converted, who has not yet welcomed Christ in his life. He already learns to do good, but he finds himself doing what? Doing wrong. He sees that the law, the law of God is good and is just, he labors to do so, but he finds himself doing the what? The opposite. Very many of us have understood the obligation of the Sabbath. And in most cases, we have struggled to keep the Sabbath. We put on our smart coats and come to church. You sit smartly. The preacher is preaching a wonderful sermon, but from nowhere you find your mind again back in business. If you're a farmer, you find your mind going back to the garden. From nowhere. You begin asking yourself why. From nowhere you begin receiving evil thoughts. You should not be surprised. That is the behavior of a wicked heart. So unless you receive a new heart, you cannot obey the commandments of God. God. You cannot obey the commandments of God. You will always struggle to do good, but you will always find yourself doing what is wrong. It is until you will surrender, as we are going to say, and the Lord does that which you cannot do in what? In your powers. It is until when we shall receive a new heart. That's when we're going to receive a blessing of being before God and happy in keeping his word, his commandments. So when you go to Romans, I think seven still, with those first few verses, it says, a carnal heart or a carnal mind is an enmity. It is an enmity to what? To God. To God. It is eight. Eh? Verse six. Verse six. So this heart is not subject to the will of what? To the will of to God. To the will of God. It does not subject itself. My brother and sister, if you still have a wicked heart, you cannot keep the Sabbath even a single second. 
you cannot worship God because that heart you still have in an inward state it is enemy to God and it will never and never subject itself to the will of what? To the will of God. To the will of God. So if we go to Romans 7, 14, 24, he says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under what? Sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. And for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. So in most cases, when we receive the gospel and we fail to fulfill our requirements, in most cases, we labor to do what is what? What is God? And we try to hate what? The gospel tells us to hate. But at the end of the day, we find ourselves doing what? What we are trying to hate. Where is the problem? The wicked heart sold you to be a slave to sin. A slave does not do what he wants to do. But he does the will of his what? Master. He does the will of his master. So in our renewed, renewed state, before we receive these three steps, we are slaves, we are captives. We are tied seriously under certain chains of sin in that we are not free to do that which we want to do, but we do the will of our what? Of our master who is in control. He says, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the Lord that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that does what? It is sin that dwells in me. There is sin that dwells in man. Sin dwells where? Sin dwells in man. And where does it dwell? Where does it dwell? It dwells in the heart. And it defiles the entire nature of man. Defiles the entire nature of man. He says, for I know that in me, that is my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present within me, but now... How to perform that which is good, I find not. Find not. In most cases, we have wished to do what is good, but when it comes to looking for power to do the will, we don't have that what? We don't have that yeah. one. So he goes ahead and says, For the good that I would, I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but a sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I say another law in my member warring against the law of mind and being me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my what which is in my member so there is another problem here so man is not just a, only a transgressor a transgressor is not only condemned to death death but is having a wicked what a wicked heart which must be put out of his what his nature so in simple terms we can say man needs to be cleansed from what man needs to be cleansed from what man needs to be cleansed from sin 
So when you come to those three steps, man must be saved from the condemnation of the what? Of the law, must be saved from the wages of what? From the wages of sin, but still man needs to be cleansed from all what? Needs to be cleansed from all sin if it's to be safe, if it's not to break again the law of what? It's not to break again the law of God. So when you come to these three steps, we must say how man is cleansed from what? I'm not hearing you. When you come to these three steps, we shall need to say how man is cleansed from what? Is cleansed from sin. We say the purpose of these three messages is to establish the kingdom of God. Of God. In the kingdom of God, there is no sin. Whoever is going to be in this kingdom must be cleansed from all sin. So we're going to labor to say how and when are we cleansed from all what? From all sin. I want you to hear me well. In those three steps, we must show how God we must understand how God cleanses us from all what? From all sin. And when is to cleanse us from all sin that we may be partakers of his what? Of his kingdom. Of his kingdom. So when we go to Isaiah 64, he says, But when, but we are all and what? unrighteous and unclean thing and all our unrighteousness I beg your pardon but we are all as unclean thing and all our righteousness are what? are filthy what? are filthy lads and we all do fed as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us what? Have taken us away. So because of this wicked heart, even those good things that we think we've done and we think they are good, they are good before God, they are what? They are unrighteous. Why? Because they are produced by a wicked what? They are produced by a wicked what? by a wicked act. When we go to Job 14, 4, he says, who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Out of the unclean. The answer is not what? No one can produce righteousness here from a wicked what? No one, I want us to move together, no one here can produce righteousness from a what? From a wicked heart. So in case we need to do righteousness, what is our greatest need? We need Jesus Christ to bless us with a new heart. To bless us with a new heart. And that is the purpose and that is the burden of the everlasting gospel on those three steps. Christ is ready to bless us with a new heart. New heart. A new heart. A new heart. Without this new heart, whatever we do is defiled by sin. Whatever we do is defiled by sin. By sin. It is defiled by self. Which is filthy like before who? Before God. So when you go to speak of prophecy, it says this. It's just confirming what we just discussed. It says, when man transgressed the divine what? The divine law, his nature became what? His nature became evil. I want to ask a question. Is evil, is evil good? Evil is what? what? It is unholy. So when man transgressed the divine what? The divine law, his nature became evil. And he was and he was in harmony and not at variance with the sun, 
with Satan. So when man transgressed, he became a friend to who? To Satan. They became united in, transgre in transgression. He says there exists naturally no enmity between sinful man and the originator of who? The originator of sin. There there is no enmity. He says naturally there is no enemy. My brother and sister, if you have a wicked heart in you, naturally there is no any enmity between you and Satan. Your friends. He does not need to grab you to go and do sin. Actually, you tell him, please come and help me accomplish this purpose. So the nature of man became weak to the extent that now there is no any enmity between man and the originator of sin. He says both became evil through apple apostasy. So the burden of the gospel or the purpose of the gospel in these three work, in these three steps is to bring back again a name. And then it between who? Seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Between the seed of the woman and the and the seed of the serpent. And the serpent him what? Him so. And you're going to see that this is addressed very well when you come to the first word. To the first gospel ever. Proclaim it to man. To man. So through those three steps, man must be established in a such way that he has naturally an he has natural an enemy between him and the sap and the serpent and the seeds of the sap of the serpent. So that is the burden of the gospel. Steps of Christ. 17.1 it says man was originally endowed with noble power and a well balanced in mind so if you read this quotation you're going to find out that the greatest problem is with what the problem is where specifically with the mind where sin was written so it says man was originally endowed with noble power and a well balanced in mind who was perfect in his being and in harmony with who? With God. But after sin, he was in harmony with who? With Satan. He says his thoughts were pure. Brothers and sisters, the thoughts were what? Were pure. His aims holy. He says, but through disobedience, his powers were perverted. And selfishness took place of love. It's not that these powers were taken away. But what happened? What happened? After disobedience, these powers were what? Were perver perverted. So where was love? Was replaced with what? With selfishness, which is the root of everything. So, when it comes to the plan of redemption, God is to restore back our heart, back our mind. Where we are always have pure thoughts and pure aims. Today someone buys a laptop. But if you can trace the aim behind it, you're going to find out that it is evil. Completely from it what? To Z. So they will build houses but with completely. And sometimes we come and worship God but with evil what? Intentions. With evil intentions. 
So God wants to recreate us back. He wants to take our self and replace it with what? No. Replace it with love. It's what we want to see in those three steps. How does God do it? And what is our responsibility? Our responsibility as God is doing it through the three steps. The three steps. The three steps. He says his nature became so weak through transgression that it was impossible for him in his own strength to resist the power of what? The power of evil in our sinful condition, in our unnewed hearts. We are so weak to the extent that we cannot resist the devil in our own strength, in our own strength. He says he was made captive by Satan and would remain so forever had not God especially interpo interposed. He says it was the tempter's purpose wrote the divine plan in man's creation and to fill the earth with war and desolation. And he would point to all this evil as a result of God's work in creating what? In creating man. He goes ahead and says it is impossible for us I want you to listen to this quotation. It is impossible for what? For us of our souls to escape from the pit of sin in which we are what? In which we were sunken. So there is a pit in which we are what? We are sunken after disobedience. There is that pit. There is that wicked heart that we receive. He says our hearts are what? Our hearts are evil. And we cannot what? We cannot change our hearts. This is where the problem is. The pit we fell in is that we received a evil heart after sin. And we cannot change this what? We cannot change this heart. He goes ahead and says, who can bring a clean thing out of the unclean? Not one. He says, the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not, a, for it is not subject to the law of what? Law of God, neither indeed can be. Then he goes ahead and says, education, culture, the exercise of will, human effort, all have their proper sphere, but they are powerless. He says, but here they are what? They are powerless in what? In changing the heart. So education, what we are doing here is what? We are being educated, isn't it? So this education we are having, it has its part. All together. The culture has its part in this plan. The exercise of will. If we go to steps to Christ, consecration. Sister White is telling us that we should know the power of the what? Will. The power of will. So, the exercise of will, it has its place in this plan. Human effort. There is where we must apply our human what? Effort in this plan. In this plan. It has its place. But all these ones are powerless when it comes to creating a new what? A new heart. There's nothing we can do as a human being in order to have a new heart created in us. He goes ahead and says, all those that are, all these that have been mentioned, they may produce an outward correctness of what? Of behavior. Some of us we've heard, we've received the gospel. Some of us are preachers of the gospel. And we've come to understand the requirements of the work of the gospel and the behavior of a good Christian. And when we come to the public, we labor and struggle 
to show good behaviors. So the education we've had, it can rip, it can produce an outward correctness of what? Behavior. You may look at the elder and say, hmm, I think the gospel has done some good work in him. By just mere looking at the outside behavior. He says, but all cannot change the what? Cannot change the heart. I want you to hear my statements. It's not that they cannot repair the heart. The issue is they cannot check. There must be a change from a wicked what? <coughs> from a wicked heart to a new what? To a new heart. In this program, it, there are no issues of repair in the heart. There is no surgery. Mr. Henry, there is no surgery here. And there is no transplanting. It is only God who is going to do the, tra the transplanting. He takes away the wicked heart. And then he implants a new heart. A new heart in our lives. He says they cannot purify the spring of what? The spring of life, which is the heart. The heart. He says there must be a power working from where? From within, through the spirit what? Through these three steps, a new life from above, before man can be changed from sin to what? To holiness. There must be a power from above, working from within, through these three steps, in order to change a man from sin to what? To holiness. And he says this power is who? He says this power is who? This power is Christ. So, unless Christ works in us there is no way there is no salvation there is no what there is no salvation he says his grace alone can quicken the lifeless faculties of the soul and attract it to God to hope to holiness So we can see clearly the problem of man when we go to Psalms 50, 51, verse 1 to 12. We know here David is writing this chapter after his fall. And is crying before God. Is repenting and putting all his great needs one by one before God. Before God. So what we need today is the mercy of God upon what? Upon us. We need the mercy of God for our sins to be what? For our sins to be what? To be forgiven, to be pardoned. Remember, we said one of our first problems, we transgressed the law of what? We transgressed the law of God, and the wages of transgressing God's law is what? Is death. So we need God's mercy to pardon our what? Our sins that we may escape this condemnation. So without the mercy of God, we are gone. So we're going to labor to show the mercy of God as it is brought to you in those three what? Three steps. How it is revealed to man. How it is brought to man. And how it is saved out of his conduct on the nation. So he says, have mercy upon him, O God. According to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy what? Of thy tender mercies. He says, blot out my transgress transgression. 
Remember our sins are written upon what? Are written upon our hearts. But as we shall proceed, we are going to see our sins are again written. Where? In the books of what? In the books of record in heaven. And these sins are before who? These sins are before God. So, we need our sins to be blotted what? Blotted out. We need our sins to be blotted out of the books of heaven. And we need sin to be blotted out of our nature. So in verse 2, he says, wash me thoroughly from my what? From my iniquity and cleanse me from my what? From my sin. My brothers and sisters, our greatest need is to have our sins and our iniquities washed away and cleansed from our nature. This was the cry of David. He knew that he has a problem. He needs to be clean. Cleanse from all sin. He says, For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me, is written upon the table, tables of his heart. He says, Again, thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mayest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judge. Judges. He says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Then verse 6, he says, Behold, thou dearest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make, shalt make me to know wisdom. Then verse 7, he says, Part me, part me with what? With horse, and I shall be what? I shall be clean, wash me, and I shall be white as what? White as a snow. We need to be washed from all our what? From all our sins. Then eight, he says, make me to hear the joy and the gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Then verse nine, he says, Hide thy face, hide thy face from my sins and blot out all of my in iniquities. We need our sins to be brought, brought out and we should see and understand it, how it is done in those three steps. Verse 10, he says, create in me a new heart. Create in me a new heart. This king knew that whenever you transgress the law of what? The law of God. The new, the clean heart disappears and you receive a what? You receive a what? You receive which heart? You receive a wicked what? I've been moving together. Yes. So this king knew that whenever we transgress the law of what? What happens to our heart? It becomes evil. And our only hope is in receiving a new heart. Is in receiving a new, a new heart. So he says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right what? Spirit a right within spirit me. within what? Me. Within me. When we transgress the law of God, even the spirit of God does what? Disappear within us. And we need it to be restored right. back in our what? In our lives. We need to fully understand it, how it is done in those three what? In those three steps of the everlasting gospel. He says, cast me not away from the from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from what? From me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and hold me with thy what? with thy spirit. So in simple terms, he's saying, please, plant an enemy for sin within my heart. An enemy for sin within my heart. my heart. Write thy laws within my heart that I may rejoice in your heart in keeping thy what? Thy command. 
their commandments. So the gospel, if you can summarize it in a simple way, its purpose is to save us from the condemnation of the word. I beg your pardon. First of all, it is to save us from sin. And what is sin? Breaking or transgression of God's word, of God's law. So we are going to labor to show how this gospel saves us from the transgression of God's word, God's law. We have seen we are all transgress transgressors. And when we transgress, there are consequences that came in what? Came in place. We are all condemned to what? To death. It is the purpose of the God, of the gospel to set us free from this condemnation. It's going to be our purpose to see how we are set free from condemnation in those three, step, three steps. What is another problem we've seen? What is another problem we've seen? Pardon? So we've seen after sin, we receive the wicked what? The wicked heart. So the gospel, the purpose of the gospel is again to plant a new heart in what? In us. And we are saying it's going to be our burden to see how the new heart is done. Is planted in us when you come to those three steps. Three step, steps. And we say the problem is not only with the heart, but once the heart was defiled, it defied the whole what? The whole net nature. Therefore, man needs to be cleansed, needs to be washed from all, from all sin if it is to go back and be a partaker of the kingdom of what? The kingdom of God. Of God. So, we are going to say how God cleanses us from all sin. Sin through the what? each one of us must go through all those three steps when we go to spiritual prophecy is telling us when we are coming to the end of the world the first second and the third angels messages must be proclaimed in their what in their order and somewhere he says these messages have been located by the word of inspiration so they are preached in their order and they have been placed in the line of prophetic history that this is where the first angel is going to come and do its work for this last generation. There is time for the second angel when it's going to stand and do its work. Its work in this generation. And then there is time for the third work. For the third angel to come and do its work in the people who are living for that generation, who are living in that genera generation. So we need to study these steps and understand them well on how we are set free from the condemnation of the law, on how we receive a new heart, on how we receive a new heart, and on how we are cleansed from all what. From all sin and how our sins are blocked, are blotted out before the presence of the what? Before the presence of God. So it's my humble prayer that here, as you move around, you keep on meditating on those important points, such that once we go into details to look at those three steps, we may all be in position to follow step after what? After step. May the Lord bless us. I think we shall end here and pick up from there in our next present presentation. So when we come back in our next presentation, we are going to go and begin looking at the first go gospel. And we see whether really this is the burden of the go of the gospel. We are going to see that this gospel has been God has been expanding it in different chapters of the back, the Bible. We are going to go to different chapters of the Bible and see whether really. This is what God has been promising his people in all generations. In all generations. And after we confirm that, we shall come now and look at the gospel 
in its fullness in figures, in parables, and in visions to have a clear picture of what God does for us and our responsibility as God is do, doing that work for us. May the Lord bless us. Let us have a very In precious and our loving Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the love that you had for us before Paul. But once more, we want to thank you so much for the love and the more love that you had and you still have for us when you went out of the way. You chose and you gave us the greatest reach of heaven. And that is your son Jesus Christ to come and die for our sins. And he resurrected to perfect our characters that we may once again be partakers of the heavenly kingdom. It is our humble prayer, Father in heaven, that you may enlighten our minds, that we may fully understand this plan of salvation. We may know how you're doing it, and that we may also know our responsibility. We pray that you may bless us with power, with wisdom, and understanding that comes from you. Bless us with mercy, and we bless that we may fulfill our obligation, that we may do for us that which we come into in our powers. We've seen education, the exercise of will and the human effort they all have. They are placed in this plan of salvation, but when it comes to changing their heart, the spring of life, none of those that can do. It requires a power from above, to work within us, to change us. It's a humble prayer, having given that you may bless us with your grace. That you may uproot that evil heart in us and bless us with that in your hand. That we all may be glorify your name. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us since this morning and since the time we came in this place. It is a humble prayer, having given that you may continue to bless us in all the donations of life, the spiritual and the physical for all the rest of the days that we are still here. We thank you so much, Father, in heaven, because you've heard our prayer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you.